Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. When we aren't afraid of death, we are less afraid of life. From these episodes, I aim for all of us to take more risks in our lives, go after our dreams, have great relationships, and some fun in the process. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And I have a question for you. What if you could ask questions of your loved ones who have died and they answered back? What would you ask? How would their answers change the way you live your life? Well, our guest today on We Don't Die Radio is the amazing Irene Kendig. Irene is a speaker, soul-centered coach, and the best-selling author of Conversations with Jerry and Other People I Thought Were Dead. In it, she asks the same question of seven loved ones on the other side. What did you experience when you released your last breath on Earth? Her book, has been honored with seven national awards and is endorsed by New York Times best-selling authors Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote the amazing series Conversations with God, and Dr. Bernie Siegel, who wrote the foreword to my book, We Don't Die. Through her coaching programs, Irene has helped hundreds of people find heaven within. Irene, welcome to our show today. Well, thank you, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate your inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. I just had a huge smile on my face reading your <laughs> intro. I don't know if you could hear it or not. Um, are you living in Virginia right now? I am. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. How nice. I just try to get a visual of where we are, and I'm in Massachusetts, um, sitting home with a little bit of stuffiness and a cold, so... Listeners, mm. beware, I might have to sneeze in the process. And Irene, tell us a little bit about yourself, because I think many of us, before we got involved with the life after death conversation, we have had professional lives and may still. And can you just tell a little bit about your background? Sure, sure. Well, um, I started off uh, in business. I started off uh, actually as a telemarketer, believe it or not. Wow. I used to sell pens and pencils nationwide. I'd get up at 6 in the morning. I lived in Los Angeles, and I would work until noon. And I was a single mom. Um, I was on food stamps, and I was just struggling to uh, you know, put food on the table. It was a very challenging time. Sure. Uh, from there, I went on to uh, do personal growth work. And the personal growth work that I did really took me from feeling like a victim in life to knowing that I'm a creator. And it was a major shift. You know, I started uh, realizing that um, I had the freedom to choose the way I wanted to respond to life instead of feeling like life was happening to me. Like a victim. Uh, Yeah. Um, And uh, and from there, I went on public speaking, uh, uh, became... uh, of my skill set and I was invited to work in the corporate world um, working for an international management consulting firm leading two-day programs for fortune 500 companies I've worked at at American Express and um, Marriott hotels and Oracle and you know major companies and I would go in and do a two-day training and 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 uh, teach how to take care of people, basically, how to treat customers, how to treat colleagues, how to create relationships that foster well-being so that you flourish in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then uh, from there, I uh, decided to go back to school. I have a bachelor's in, in psychology from UCLA. And I decided to go back to school to the University of Santa Monica to get a master's degree in spiritual psychology. Hmm. Um, you know, the word psychology, uh, the root of that is psyche, which means spirit. And uh, throughout my time at UCLA, never once did I hear the word spirit mentioned in any of my classes. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> and so uh, at the University of Santa Monica in Los Angeles, they put the spirit back into psychology. And they begin with the premise that we are divine and eternal beings 
using a body for the purpose of having a temporary human experience. Oh, and that's that. the first principle. Uh, so uh, during those two years, um, I ended up writing conversations with Jerry and other people I thought were dead. It's a great title. Yeah, thank you. It makes people laugh. Well, that's and, not uh, a bad thing. No, it's a good thing because, you know, in our can be culture, very we just, heavy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Someone wrote a book called Do Dead People Watch Me in the Shower? <laughs> yes, this is that a great title. Yes, yeah, so a little humor is not a bad thing. Not at all. So tell us about that. Well, I was I had just started the Masters in Psychology program and um it was in October of 2006 and I got a call from a friend and she said um I know this amazing woman. Uh, she has a, a gift. She can communicate with people who've passed on, and she wants to make it her life's work. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to do a session with her? I hesitated. I had a lot on my plate, and mm -hmm. I figured even if she did have this amazing gift, there wasn't anyone that I felt compelled to speak with. <laughs> right. Uh, still, I was curious. Sure. She wouldn't charge you anything, my friend said. She would just want you to tell other people if you thought she was the real deal. So I schedule an appointment, and uh, there I am about to talk to a woman who claims she can talk with dead people. Mm -hmm. And um, it seemed, uh, you know, a little strange, but um, she got on the phone, and she said, give me the first name of a person you'd like to speak with. I said, Biba. I didn't tell her that Biba was my mom mm -hmm. or that she had transitioned three years prior. She began to describe my mother in very accurate terms, on physically. And then she said, uh, Biba's uh, laughing. She's playing cards. She says she's winning. Does this sound like Biba? My jaw dropped. My mom would practically greet me at the door with a deck of cards. <laughs> she loved to play cards. That's and great. Fact, I know. And in fact, some of our most memorable conversations had taken place over games of gin rummy. That's great. And I flashed, as she was speaking, I flashed on this one conversation that my mom and I had had years prior. Um, and it was over a game of gin rummy. And my mom said, you know, when I was a little girl, my mother told me then w that when we die, that's the end. Now, most people wouldn't have noticed the way she bit the inside of her lower lip, mm -hmm. but I knew my mother. And I said to her, well, you know, if that thought and that belief makes you fearful, choose another. And she picked a card and said, Jin. Hmm. And that was the end of that conversation. And I was really interested. My mother is one of the people that I speak with in the book, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, coming back to the conversation with this woman named Jana, the medium, she then continued to speak to me about my mother and to say things to me that uh, they, were ir they were irrefutable. I mean, I knew I was connected with my mom. She then put me in touch with three more people, and at the end of the conversation, I hung up the phone, and I danced around my, my house Aww. for two solid hours, and I... I was rejoicing because prior to that conversation, I was 95% sure we go on. But there was always that little bit of doubt. Right. Is it just faith or do we really? Yeah. I know that doubt. But after that session, Sandra, I was 100% confident. And the difference between 95 and 100% is monumental because sure. it leaves no room for doubt. It's like you know. It's the other, before I would think, I would hope, I would believe. But now, it was none of that. It was, I know. Oh. That's I'm smiling. Big, cheesy yeah. grin on my face, thinking of my dad, my grandmother, oh. um, my, my cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, I noticed uh, all kind of inside, things were reorganizing themselves. Like, the way I identified myself prior to that session was, I'm a human being with a soul. Mm-hmm. After that session, it was, it was such a clear new identity. I am a divine and eternal soul using a body for the purpose of having a temporary human experience. You have a quote on your website 
and I think it's yours, this lifetime is a thread in the fabric of your soul. Yeah. I gave me goosebumps because no longer a body with a soul. It's just that this oh. lifetime is just a teeny tiny part of That's right. of just this grand being that I really am. So And you know, you know, and it makes sense, you know, how we identify ourselves determines the questions we ask. For example, if I, when I shared that, you know, in my, my earlier years I identified myself as a victim. Mm-hmm. A victim of circumstance. And so when something would happen, I would ask a question that a victim would ask who perceives themselves as a, as a victim because there really aren't any victims. However, you can perceive that you're a victim. Nice. And so from that perspective, I would ask, why is this happening to me? Why is God punishing me? Mm-hmm. When, when, my, I, when my identity changed and I now experience myself as a divine and eternal soul, when something happens, I ask, what would my soul have wanted me to learn? What would my soul have wanted me to learn? That's great. From this. Yeah, now, that's a very different question than why is this happening to me. That one leaves me powerless. The other one drives me to find the learning because I know that everything that's happening, everything, no matter what it looks like, that this is a benevolent universe and that everything that happens is for my highest good, no matter what it looks like. But it's up to me to squeeze the learning out. I'm writing this down. That's why I'm quiet. Everything is for my highest good. Everything. Even when it doesn't look that way and it's extremely high, painful, suffering. Yes. yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. It's when when we're challenged during those very difficult times. That's when I I would say it like this. School's in session. School's in session. Mm -hmm. Your soul is wanting you to learn something. What is it? What is it? And the the whole idea of not being a victim, I still remember when I learned that. And so for anyone listening right now, it's so easy to, no matter how old you are, we many of us have never heard this concept that this could be growth for our soul. And so just play around with it a little bit because many of us have been used to being in the victim mode and not really realizing it could be for another reason so if you're somebody living that right now just understand that there might be another way there might be another way of looking at it and in so looking at um, this being an education for you or it's for your higher good it may actually and will empower you um, Mm -hmm. and actually cause a lot less suffering I Mm -hmm. think if you probably agree to this Irene but the more we're in victim mode the more we suffer absolutely because you know one of the things uh, uh, in the conversation that I learned is that life isn't happening to us it's happening through us you have to be in, a, in alignment with an experience in order for it to take place so you know if it's yeah. taking place for you you know you're in alignment for that experience so what can you get out of it okay yeah Good, 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 good coaching. What else can you tell us? I'm, 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 I know there's so much. So then, Who's Jerry? Yeah, so then you after, tell us who, after who Jerry is, because the, the, the name of your book is Conversations with Jerry. Starts yes. off with. I want to know who Jerry is too before you. Yeah. <laughs> well, after that initial session with Jana, okay. I scheduled another one just a few days later, and 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 she successfully connected me with seven loved ones, seven or eight loved ones during those two sessions. And at the end of that session, the second session, I asked her if she was interested in uh, exploring further and collaborating, and she, she said yes. So what we did was we met one hour a day, five days a week, for the next two years. Oh, my gosh. And, and the That's conversation a commitment. took place by phone. Yeah, and you know, it speaks to the power of taking small actions consistently in service to a goal or a vision. Right. Yeah. So we did that, and uh, in the course of those two years, seven of my loved ones stepped forward in service to the book, Mm -hmm. and um, I begin each conversation with, what did you experience when you released your last breath on earth? Jerry was was the husband of my best friend, and he... Um, was 68 years old and he found out that he had a brain tumor and he had two months 
to live. Okay. He was at that time traveling a lot. He lived in Northern California, and he was traveling a lot to Japan. He was working with a, uh, a Zen master. And um, three weeks prior to transitioning in his own bed, his own home, uh, he was ordained as a Buddhist priest. And he was confident that he was moving into loving expansion, and he tells me in the book that he practically melted out of his body. Whereas my friend Jared, who was in his 30s um, and had no quality of life, he'd had a back injury, and he'd had a couple of back surgeries that hadn't gone well, and it left him really incapacitated and on morphine, and he had, again, no quality of life. And so when he transitioned, he told me that, he shot out of his body like a bullet out of a gun, but he was ready. Uh, he was ready. He had been suffering for a long time. Sure. And so each person, uh, so there are seven people. My friend Bill committed suicide. He was 35. And I was really looking forward to those conversations because, as you well know, there's a lot of stigma and shame associated with suicide. And I want to be a stand for clarifying some of the misunderstandings that are out in the world. Uh, it's, it, it's hard enough to grieve the loss of a loved one, but when you've got all that stigma on top and judgment, and oof, makes it so much harder could, than it needs Could we to be. take a little do detour, detour and just talk about that? Because I know there's a lot of our listeners who have had a loved one who have committed suicide, and sure. you're right about the stigma, because so many people are like, how could they do that? They must have been so weak, and I'm thinking, oh, they're taking the easy way out, and I'm sorry, but I can't imagine that that would be an easy thing to do. Oh. And and I, and I also, there's a lot of stigma around um, people that commit suicide, they go to hell, or they're in this terrible place, and you know, Correct me if I'm wrong and from your research, but it's just the opposite. I mean, you must be a tormented, um, have a tormented life really to take that action. And I would think that there's learning to be done on the other side, but you're also embraced as a, as a perfect and unconditionally loved soul. Yeah. So, Absolutely. You got that right. Yeah. yeah. Could you just share a little bit about your findings with sure. that? So, um, so people... So people who are um, thinking about suicide are already in a living hell. Mm -hmm. um, and hell isn't a location, it's a state of consciousness, as is heaven. Heaven is a state of consciousness. We can be living in an inner heaven or an inner hell. We are, we are free to choose and to create uh, what we want. And but you're talking happens, right here, right now. Right here, right now. On earth, okay. In, in, and in fact, I'm not waiting to get to heaven um, I'm taking it with me. Oh, you gave me goosebumps yet again. I'm taking it with me. Okay, okay. Uh, so, um, and and uh, because judgment and and joy cannot coexist, and I like to live in a state of joy and loving, um, I have to be willing to release the judgments that I have, judgments that uh, I'm not deserving, I'm not good enough, mm -hmm. um, I'm not, you know, this is a, a universal one that seems to be all over the planet, global, is I'm not enough. Not yes. good enough, smart enough, pretty enough, talented thin enough, enough. Thin enough. Thin uh, enough. You know, you, on and on it goes. We have to be willing to give that up if we want to live in heaven, in an inner heaven. Um, and so uh, part of the training that I got at the University of Santa Monica is how to release judgment so that I can keep coming back to this heavenly place inside myself, this place of unconditionally, unconditional loving that, that is who I am. But in any case, back to Bill who committed suicide. So people who um, are thinking about suicide, here's what they've done. They've created walls to protect themselves. And the problem is that they, without knowing it, have created an inner prison and nobody can get in. Oh boy. They can, nobody can get in. And they have to be willing to open out so that somebody can get in. Um, I remember uh, Bill telling me that, uh, I said, you know, I, he said, no one is responsible. No one is responsible for the death of another. Each of us is responsible for ourselves. Yes. And we choose, uh, before we come into physical world reality, we've already 
chose in a lot of the circumstances of our lives for purposes of spiritual growth. That includes our death as well. Um, it, we know on a soul level uh, how long we plan to live. And we don't come in as individuals. We come in as soul families, and we all are in agreement with one another on, oh, I'll play this part for you so that you can grow, and you'll play this part for me. So I, I'll be the bad guy in your play because that will help you understand X, Y, or Z. Does that make sense? Oh, I I have um, some players in my life, even around the death of my dad, um, in sibling relationships, and I just can't get why some things happen the way they did and in if i take on that we all made this agreement to be these players um, they did what they needed to do so that i would do the research about grief so that i would have this book and now the radio show and everything else i'm doing um, to help others so instead of making them wrong what you just gave me irene is permission to make them right that because of them so many people are getting some help that they need. So. Yeah, and you know, sometimes it takes a little time and distance to see, wow, you know, that was really a blessing. I couldn't see it then, but look what came out of it. Mm. Um, yeah, and so, um, so uh, one of the things that I say to Bill is, you know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm so glad that he shared this with me because um, my friend Denise, was scheduled to have dinner with her brother Dan and she canceled at the last minute and Dan committed suicide and oh, she wow. was living with all this regret and remorse and guilt but sure. if only she hadn't canceled he'd still be alive right. and the truth is that even if she had made that dinner it wasn't up to her Dan still would have had to open the door from the inner prison he'd created in order to allow her in because even if she'd shown up that doesn't mean he'd still be alive right and even though she didn't show up if dan had had an intention to not end his life someone or something would have happened that would have steered him in a different direction right because the universe is always responding always if he had said i need help help would have come but he didn't he didn't do that and so he ended his life um, but uh, you know it's interesting one of the things that I've discovered with regret is that people um, who are feeling regret that oh if only they had done that but they didn't do it if only they had done that things would have turned out differently mm-hmm. uh, the mind makes an enormous assumption it assumes that whatever we didn't do that we think we should have would have turned out fine but guess what we don't know that. We don't. There could be a million but, different possibilities exactly. of how it goes. But, but look what the mind does. Oh, the sure. mind says, oh, see, it would have worked out okay. Had you done, but that's not true. No. We have to question the assumption the mind makes. When, whenever we're in regret, we have to say, well, wait, I'm assuming, my mind is assuming it would have turned out, be- turned out better or turned out okay. And there's no way you can know that. There is none. And I believe that every human being at every moment does the best they can with what they've got and if another possibility of how to behave um, showed up then maybe we would have gone down that path but we didn't we we do what we can so it's 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 a but again that's something our mind does to us makes us stew upon it it was there any words from bill about what he experienced when he transitioned yes uh, in answer to the question what did he experience when he released his last Last breath breath. yep he says that he uh, he started laughing. He said he started laughing, and he was looking at his body and laughing that he ever could have taken himself so seriously. Aww. He said he realized he was laughing, and he wondered how he could be laughing, because he thought, don't you have to have a physical body to laugh? Right. And he realized that <laughs> laughter comes from the soul. Oh, that's and nice. And then he thought, well, who's looking at this body? that I thought was me. Right. Right? He said, you know, I I had killed Bill, but I was still alive. And I still felt like me, but I felt lighter. He said he wondered where that heaviness had gone that had been with him. And um, he said he went from feeling consumed by uh, emotional pain 
a feeling, a, a certain sense of relief in this new form. He said it's kind of like if you slam the door, um, the car door on your on your fingers, and then you pulled your fingers out, there would be a certain sense of relief. Yes. It's that kind of thing. That's what he compared it to. Interesting. Um, and so uh, from there, he says that, um, I asked him, was there a penalty for taking your life? And he said, well, if by penalty you mean was I punished, the answer is no. Who would we punish? Who would do the punishing? You're the only one who can punish yourself. And when you do, you affect everyone. What do you mean? Well, think about the state of we really are. There's only oneness going on. And we're all connected. We're all connected, and there's only oneness going on. There's not even, in physical world reality, there isn't even separation. There's only perceived separation. There can be no separation. There's only one thing going on. There's oneness. So when he's out of his body and experiencing a sense of oneness, well, there is no other. There is no me and you. There's only us. Us. Right? right. So there's nobody to do the punishing. And this is not a punishing universe. This is a benevolent universe. Mm -hmm. Like he says, we are the only ones who can punish ourselves. And we punish ourselves when we believe that we deserve, when we don't know who we are, that's when we punish ourselves. When you know who you are, when you know that you are a spark of the divine, when you know that your essence is loving and kind and generous and wise, uh, you don't have a need to punish yourself. You're leaving me speechless because I do a lot of self-judgment and I think many of us do. Of course. And if that wasn't present and there was this compassion and forgiveness and self-love, wow. That's really who you are. That's the essence of who you are. All the other stuff, I'm not good enough, she shouldn't have died so young. Uh, this world is screwed up. All of that stuff, all that judgment, that comes from the ego. That's all ego stuff. So because it sounds like we don't have the ego when we cross over. Right. Yay! You, you leave the ego. <laughs> now, you still have, it's interesting, oh. but what I'm told is that when we initially cross over, whatever we believe we'll experience is what we experience. Just like here in physical world reality, you notice that what you believe, you get to experience whatever you believe. If you believe that you're unlovable, inadequate, and unworthy, guess what? You'll the find universe, evidence everywhere. The universe will let you feel that. Why? Because that's your belief. Right. The universe gives you what you believe. Someone once told me, Irene, that if you're planning a trip to Hawaii, all of a sudden you'll start seeing Hawaiian shirts everywhere. Or if you're going to buy a Volkswagen bug, right? right. All of you, a sudden start you start seeing, seeing the Volkswagens anywhere. everywhere. So yeah, whatever, that's how it works, isn't it? Right, it is. So it is. It, you're going to find evidence of being unlovable. And um, I like the flip side of that because at one point in my life, I really, I didn't want to say I started concentrating on miracles. That's not the right way to say it. But whatever my frame of mind was is that miracles were possible. All of a sudden, these mind-blowing, I call them miracles, kept showing up. And it was such a cool thing. But, of course, my ego put that aside. I ended up getting back into victim mode and forgot all about it. Until we're talking it's a journey, about it isn't it? It's it a is. journey, you know. And uh, we do the best we can, you know. We do the best we can in every moment. And, uh, and uh, I think that, you know, how we relate to whatever the issue is, that's the issue. Can we love ourselves? Can we embrace ourselves even when we're going through hard times? Even when we're saying to ourselves, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not this or that. Is there a part of us that we can embrace that smaller part and go, oh, that's so hard, isn't it? It's, oh, I should just feel your suffering. Come here, let me just hold you. Sometimes I just embrace myself and I go, oh, come here. <laughs> it's just, you know, you're having a human experience. Yeah, we it's would do it easy. for anybody else. You know, we would, I, wouldn't we? There was somebody I interviewed not too long ago that um, – She's gorgeous, and you cannot even believe the inner self-talk about being ugly and too fat and all this stuff. And I'm like looking at her like, 
what you know and you just want to hug somebody and say that, that none of that's real that's what your mind is telling you but it's not reality you know exactly. what, what's real is what everybody in the li- in your life tells you about you you're yeah. the, very we're very often the only one with these negative opinions about ourselves no one else can see it because it's not the truth yeah i'm reminded of that line it is only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye oh and in that in her case it sounds like you know if she were to see herself with her heart instead of with her eye mm-hmm. she would you know perhaps her heart would soften and she would be more gentle with herself. Irene, from all of the training and everything you've explored, I just want to ask this question. Um, The ego, this part of us that is so negative with the negative judgments and the fear, um, what point does that serve for us? Because it's obviously here for a reason. And is it's got something to do with us learning and loving and and overcoming and realizing who we really are i mean yeah i think it's it's a construct and without that construct i don't know that we could and without that construct and a physical body i don't know if we could have a a a a physical experience um and part of that construct includes the things that we've come here to heal and to learn so, for example, if I came in to physical world reality as a soul needing to learn how to love myself, I might choose uh, a mom who wasn't very, you know, who was wounded in, in the same way I was wounded, and she couldn't give it to me, so I had to go off and find it on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would need to have something in place that tells me I'm not lovable and I'm not good enough because that's what I came to heal. (laughs) And I would choose circumstances as a soul that would support me in that. Um, So no matter, and and no matter how challenging the circumstances are, there is always love, always. That's the essence of the universe's love. That's, you know, that love is another word for God, Mm -hmm. love, or light. You know, so, um, yeah, I'm reminded, too, that, you know, darkness is, is, you know, if you want to, if you want to get rid of darkness, what you do is you increase the light. Darkness exists within a greater context of light, just like fear isn't a sep- isn't separate from love. Fear, if you want to extinguish fear, you increase the love. It's a component, and so... Sometimes we think of things, these things as separate, you know, dark and light are separate because we live in a world of, the physical world is one of duality. Mm-hmm. Um, but in truth, in, the, in truth, there's only oneness. And, um, but we get to experience this duality and, um, and through that to grow as souls. Mm, that's beautiful. I've often heard, too, when someone's really depressed or grieving or is going through a bad time, this is kind of what you just said in action when you take the time and you make a difference for another and you put your attention on helping another what you're what's really happening is you are turning up the love absolutely so. absolutely you know um, I'm part of a group of uh, volunteers from the University of Santa Monica and we've been working at um, one of the largest maximum security prisons in the world uh, for about eight years now eight or nine years and what's amazing, Sandra, is that um, when we go in and there's like, say, 50 volunteers or 70 of us volunteers, and we're working with 300 women at a time, and all of us, we know who we are. We know. That's the, powerful. Yeah, and we go in like a battery of light, and we see the women not as their mistakes, uh, not, a, not as the bad choices that they've made. We see them as divine beings just like us. And they're not used to that. No. But when we start seeing them that way, they start responding. And it's not uncommon to hear a woman stand up in a group of 300 and raise her hand and stand up and say, you know, I'm so grateful to be in prison because it's here that I've now discovered who I really am. Oh, that's beautiful. So you can be in an inner prison and be in the free world, but you can also be in an outer prison and be free inside yourself. 
I have a friend in my life who has gone through some tough times and has had a lot of anger and fear and I made a choice a while ago is only to speak to him about the positive and the the light that shines within him and really acknowledge the good and the the great things and over the past few years Irene I've seen him transform into being this powerhouse that um, really is focusing now on you know really is accepting that he is wonderful as opposed to listening to the negative inside so to be able to impact those women and only speak to their greatness or their divinity I mean that's a practice we can all do it's so Um, easy to feel find fault with people and and you know getting into arguments never really does work out for anybody's benefit but to see the good to see from their perspective um, I got a fortune cookie once that said the best place to stand in an argument is on the other person's side you know um, to really side with the good so well, any time we, we create opposition, you know, we're, we're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, well, not, I shouldn't say wrong direction. It's just ineffectual. Yes. You know, it's like, uh, who was it that said, I think Mother Teresa said, I will march for peace, but I will not march against war. Right. Against this. And, you know, Jerry in the book says, uh, he talks about fear, and he says, you know, fear is like junk food. It's an empty calorie. It, it fills us up, but it doesn't nourish us. Oh, my gosh. That's brilliant. Yeah. So um, you're so right oh. when you say that, you know, you're going to find what you look for. Yes. Uh, and so look for the, you know, one of the practices that I have is leaving people in better shape after interacting with them than before I found them. You know, Mother Teresa's got that same quite quote. Oh, does she? Yep. I read oh, that, okay. and I will never forget it. So yeah, so I find to you I too. make it a point find find reasons to acknowledge people. Mm-hmm. What a whatever it is. Oh, I just so love the way that you, you know, answered the phone. What a beautiful voice you have. Or whatever it is, find ways to acknowledge people. And and when you do, it's like it's like watering the flowers. You know, they 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 will give their best to you. Well, not because, only that uh, is um. My dad died in the hospital. He had cancer, and he was in a lot of pain. And I spent a lot of time with him um, right by his side. And we played this game that every nurse or assistant or doctor that came into his room, that they would leave happier than when they walked in. (laughs) And so we acknowledged them. We made them laugh. And not only did that person get to feel happy walking out of the room but it also eased my dad's pain and it yeah. made me feel good ah win 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 <laughs> win, win, win. Oh, nice that's a great game to play i love it yeah and it did it really made a difference well what else can you tell me you live in your own shoes with all these good things and i don't know what else to ask you well let's see um um oh i will tell you that my my friend jared um uh, I asked him, um, was there anything he missed about being in a physical body? And he said, no, there was nothing that he missed, but that he did wish that his friends and family uh, on the physical plane um, would acknowledge his presence, his presence, not so much for him, but for them, because he knew he was alive, but they didn't. Oh. He said, and um, when they can't experience me with their five senses, they think I don't exist. Right. They think there's nowhere to put their love for me. Loneliness is people falsely believing that there's no one there to receive their love. Wow. Yeah, and he said, and that creates sadness. And he feels sad because he shares in the experience of sadness with his family. Because he says, I feel sad that they're sad. And I said, well, why would you choose to feel sad? And he said, because I want to share in their experience. Because I love them. Did they say how we can get in touch with them? How we can talk to them? Um, Well. You know what I'm asking? Yeah. I mean, I have my own thoughts about this, but from you, um, uh, how do I? Yes. What I got is, 
uh, first of all, if there's anything incomplete that you need to say to a loved one that's transitioned, say it, write it, um, imagine that they're sitting there and talk to them. Right. Okay, and complete whatever needs to be completed. If you're already complete with a relationship and there's no, nothing hanging out there that needs to be said in that way, then connecting with the joy. It's, it's the love and the joy that, that, that really connects us. And so my Aunt Paula says, uh, she was an octogenarian when she passed, and she says she hasn't missed a social event since, she, since, since leaving. She's always at, whenever there's intense emotion, be it sorrow or joy, she's there. I don't remember what octogenarian means. It, she was in her 80s. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. She, is, I think that's passed, what it means. Yeah, she passed <laughs> in her sleep. But she's and, uh, at every event. She says, I haven't missed a family event yet. That's beautiful. So <laughs> am I correct in assuming? So I'm sitting here on the couch by myself in the physical form that it would be a benefit not only that but like your friend jared said for me to just know that grammy's here on the couch with me my dad is here some other relatives that i have this um army of people around me and that i'm not alone and i can still share with them and send love to them rejoice with them is that all fair to say absolutely and that i will live a better life knowing that that relation those relationships are still alive and well because here's the thing Here's the thing. When someone transitions, you no longer have the physical aspect of no. the relationship, but you still have a relationship. It just has changed form. And we have to discover ways because the veil is getting thinner and thinner. We have to find ways to um, express and, and uh, express because the relationship still exists. Um, so I say to people, you know, assume your loved one hears you until you know otherwise. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Because I have people say, my dad's been dead two years and he's never given me a sign and they want to go to a medium. I'm like, but he could be right here, right now, next to you. Uh -huh. And for oh. whatever the reason. Um, and, I w and I would say this, Sandra, I would say a couple of things. Number one, going to a medium can be life-altering as it was for me. Yes. And you need to be discerning about just like a doctor you go to a doctor you want to be discerning about the doctor you go to what are their credentials what have you what have, what do the patients of that doctor say my mom irene says oh, yeah. um, this is her little joke but she says what do you call the guy that graduated the bottom of his um, medical class and the answer what? is doctor <laughs> <You know? laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, <laughs> that's so true i love that every yes. field you've got you're outstanding, you're good, you're the ones that just scrape by and the ones that, who knows? Exactly um. right. So you <laughs> want to make sure that you get one who is dedicated and in service. Right. That isn't about, you know, it isn't about making money, it isn't about, it's about being in service. Um, you know, when I first started working with this medium, she would take two hours prior to the session to prepare between yoga and meditation she wanted to be the clearest possible channel she could be that's the kind of person that you want to yeah talk. that's the real deal and that is the real service. deal irene will we see our loved ones again when it's our time to absolutely absolutely you will uh, every one of my loved ones was greeted by someone that they loved on the other side yeah, um that's and great. um my understanding too is if if that's what you wish that's what you choose um, they are waiting. They are waiting. When we transition, they are waiting to be called forward. But if, if, if it's not something that you want, you, you, you won't experience it. But if that's what you want, you will. Our pets, too? Pets as well, absolutely. We are all, ultimately, we are all energy. Yes. Um, and, and, and pets are no different. We, you know, they are made of energy, and they take a certain form here in physical world reality, and I'm looking forward to seeing my Kali Panchita when I transition. Yeah, and talk about unconditional love. Um, I've yeah. had some pets that, you know, what a, they, they are heaven on earth. They are that feeling oh, of yes. good, bad, or indifferent. I think of one Absolutely. of the dogs that I've had that always happy. What you know? an amazing, what an amazing creation, a dog. Yeah.
Can yeah. you share a little bit about, um, I know our time's going by fast, but this whole theory of finding the heaven within and living heaven on earth right sure. now? Is Absolutely. there anything we can do, even just a practice, um, and you might have already said it, you know, about the judgments and things. But Yeah, that well, I'm in the process of, uh, you know, in my soul-centered coaching, that's what I do one-on-one with people. But okay. I'm in the process of creating programs that will take people step-by-step step through, for example, um, releasing the misidentifications, the false beliefs that we have about ourselves. You know, when we, we talk poorly to ourselves or we're critical of ourselves releasing that because you see this this unconditionally loving place exists in each of us this divine place and we've got all this stuff on top you know that's part of you know what we grew up with and what we were taught and what we believe and all of this stuff and some of it serves us and some of it doesn't and so what i facilitate people in doing is letting go of what doesn't serve you anymore and how do you clear away the judgments and learn to live to move through life um, uh, you know judgment free so that you can start accessing that inner place so one of the things that I would say is start noticing anytime you're upset anytime you find yourself upset just stop and say what's the judgment here hmm. so maybe uh, the judgment is you know, he shouldn't have said that. Right. Well, according to who? Because he just did say that. Or I shouldn't have and gotten usually, a flat tire. Yeah, I shouldn't have gotten a flat tire. Well, according to who? Right. Um, because you're arguing then with reality. If he said, if you think he shouldn't have said what he said, but he said it, now you're arguing with reality. And what's happening is that you're arguing with what is because you have some standard inside that says that shouldn't be happening that will cause suffering yes. so you want to start becoming aware of what your judgments are um, and just notice what they are and then what I'm putting together is a program to teach compassionate self-forgiveness so that when that happens we can forgive ourselves and release the judgment because remember love and judgment cannot coexist you have to choose one over the other you're either going to be right you shouldn't have said that and then you get to be stuck with being right but very unhappy or you get to release it and go, gee, how do I know what he should have said? He said what he said. You know? I just thought I, of a good something we can all do. Just on a yeah. piece of paper, write love or judgment. And if we were to keep that with us for, say, 24 hours and those moments that we're either upset at somebody else or we look in the mirror and we don't like what we see, if we had something around us that love or judgment and that maybe could flip us. I mean, we don't have to think about it. We could just say, oh, I'm judging myself. What can I do to love and look at the person in the mirror exactly. or self and appreciate yeah. them and love them? I think that would be a good bit of homework. Absolutely. You know, another one is, you know, is taking 100% responsibility without blaming anyone. So one of the things, for example, is if you're upset, if, if somebody says something and it upsets you, where does, where does the upset where is it occurring? Right. It's occurring inside each of us, right? Yes. So the person was just a trigger. So you take responsibility for the upset because it's inside of you. So if you can refrain from blaming anyone and just going, okay, this really triggered something. Now, this is mine to deal with. They didn't cause it. They were just a trigger. It was already there. They're just bringing it to my awareness. So basically, you could say thank you to the person and then work on what it is that got triggered inside of you without blaming anyone. I this have is a, a big one. That's a big one. That's huge. And here's the thing, too. I think a lot of us, especially anyone who's taking the time to listen right now, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking this time because you could be plenty of other places but you're sure. invested in yourself and I think that's why you're listening um, but what often happens is we do a lot of this um, self-help soul growth things for us but then we look at some people in our life that are miserable and they're angry and they're victims and is there something we can do to contribute to them I know we're all on our own journeys but sometimes it gets really hard to be with some of the people in our life and many people are married to these people or have children or parents of these people um, 
and I know we have to respect everybody's on their own journey but if we're finding this peace from not judging ourselves and replacing it with love and looking within is there a way that we can give this to someone else without making them upset not pushing it on them any just, just love people where they are just love them where be, they are love them where they are you know if you can just love yourself where you are and be compassionate with yourself then it's going to be natural for you to have compassion for others you know just remember people are doing the best they know how to do That's we all true. are in any given moment we're all doing our best and just remember that when you look at people because a lot of times you judge people against how you some standard that you have you know if they knew better they would do better as oprah always says and yeah uh, yeah so you know have compassion for people and always too another thing that really helps me is remembering that behind every negative behavior there's a positive intention so even if somebody is behaving oh. negatively, they're trying to accomplish something positive, and that's the only way they know how to do it. Isn't that, that interesting? Yeah. So huh. then, so then, if you know that they're not trying to just irritate you or upset they, me, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. That's not their intention. Their intention is they're trying to accomplish something positive. If you can discover what that intention is, then you can meet them there and help them to find another way to accomplish that positive intention. Yeah. You've got some really huge pieces of gold in this interview, Irene. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, in writing the book, I think, you know, one of the things that I came away with from, from you know, talking with my seven loved ones is that um, we really struck gold while we were looking, digging for answers about life. Yeah, that's and beautiful. they gave hundreds and hundreds of nuggets of insight and wisdom that have helped me to live life in a way that I move through the world with inner peace and gratitude. I'm grateful. I'm grateful all the time, uh, moment to moment. I really focus on what can I be grateful for right now. That really helps. And so, you know, I'm just really thankful that, you know, I got to be part of this team in bringing uh, so much of this information forward. Mm -hmm. And you're such an inspiration. If you could remind me and our listener again, um, the name of your book, how we can yep, find it, your sure. website, how we can find out more about you, because you've got a great sure. website. It's Conversations with Jerry and Other People I Thought Were Dead. Love it. Uh-huh. And the website is www.irenekendig.com or www.conversationswithjerry.com. And uh, on my website, I have, if people want to go and, and, um, and sign in, they can access a, uh, uh, an article on how to release regret and also how to practice compassionate self-forgiveness step-by-step for removing judgment. Oh, I think Great. I'd like that myself. Great. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you and your listeners. Oh, Irene, it's been an honor, and I promise we'll stay connected because you're Wonderful. a good gal to know and, and I'll share you with everybody I know. Oh, thank thanks. you, thank you, thank you. And and to our listener, yes, our time has come to an end, um, but I remind you, it, when you go to the website wedontdieradio.com you can find a picture of Irene, um, a link to her website, a link to her book, and some of the great quotes she said because she's just phenomenal and also i have a thank you gift there for joining us today and that's at we don't die radio.com and i'd like to leave everyone from with a quote that i actually um, listened to i watched the video on irene's page and i kept pausing because i this really moved me that a quote that she speaks on the video and it is we have the freedom to choose our response to life regardless of our circumstance and I choose gratitude love generosity acceptance peace compassion kindness forgiveness honesty and joy and I ask all of us maybe today whenever you hear this when those that judgment mind pops out replace it with one of those things this is Sandra Champlain. I believe that life is an education for our soul and that your life here on earth is important. So I thank you from the bottom.